Good morning, everyone. My name is Karen King. I am with the Office of New Haven Affairs at Yale University. Uh, I work in community affairs, and it is my pleasure to host these monthly community breakfasts on the first Thursday of every month during the academic year. We started hosting these uh, breakfasts uh, in uh, at the beginning of the pandemic virtually. We are gonna to continue to do that in the near future until hopefully we're able to come together again for our fabulous breakfast. If you're one of my um, OGs and you've been coming for years, I know you're looking forward to having the, the wonderful breakfast and the, the camaraderie. Um, believe me, we're looking forward to that again. But in the meantime, we're still, um, I still look forward to these breakfasts every month so that I can hear these wonderful speakers and I can still have some community um, with you all, if, if only virtually. Um, before we get started with our wonderful speakers, I have a few announcements um, and I'm going to share my screen. Uh, the university is um, open. Students started their uh, first day of classes yesterday. Um, we have information on our website, the Office of New Haven Affairs. It is onha.yale.edu. I will put this link in the description along with the, uh, in the chat, along with the other uh, links that I will um, discuss right now. On our website, you can find information uh, about upcoming events, uh, uh, the university's COVID resources, uh, news, et cetera. The university, although we aren't, can't come together en masse in person, we have continued to offer a number of workshops, classes, performances virtually. I encourage everyone to regularly visit the Yale Calendar of Events, which is at calendar.yale.edu. I will put that link in that link in the chat. A few upcoming events are uh, uh, an, an event called the Just, Justice is a Black Woman, the Life of, and Work of Constance Baker Motley. That's, that will take place next, on Monday the 13th from 6 to 7.30. It is online. It is hosted by the Yale African American Affinity Group, the Working Women's Network, and the New Haven Club of the National Association of Negro Business and Professional Women. Uh, this is a virtual screening of, of a film, and they will have discussion afterwards with the filmmaker, Dr. Gary Ford Jr. There, it, registration is encouraged. It is a free event. I will place this link in the chat. Wyndham Campbell are these wonderful prizes uh, that are uh, hosted at the Beinecke Library. The Wyndham, Wyndham Campbell Prizes annually award a number of writers an unrestricted $165,000 gift donation for these wonderful writers to continue to hone, present, um, and share their uh, craft. This year's, uh, this year's awardees are on the Wyndham Camel website. There are a number of online uh, uh, meetings, workshops, et cetera, that will be available over the coming weeks so that you can meet each one of these uh, gifted people. Uh, if you visit the calendar of events, you can stay apprised on, on when those events will be taking place. You can also go to the Wyndham Campbell website. Uh, and we, as we get into our discussion this morning, I want to remind you that the university posted a COVID-19 website, it's covid19.yale.edu. It, it is one place for you to go to learn about our efforts, uh, our statistics. I love how the university, we have been very transparent um, with our efforts, our continuing efforts to help to maintain safe communities um, throughout uh, New Haven. Uh, and these wonderful women who are joining us this morning are going to describe this and many other things COVID related. So we are going to move into our speakers. We have three doctors joining us this morning. Dr. Stephanie Spangler joined the office of the provost in 1995 and serves as provostial liaison for the schools of medicine, nursing and public health, Yale University Health Services, the office of environmental health and safety and other health and biomedical units. She also oversees the Provost Office of Academic Integrity, established in 2011, working with colleagues throughout the university to fortify and consolidate programs and procedures relating to academic integrity. Additionally, she is charged with leadership of the university-wide Title IX compliance and related activities. Before assuming her present position, Dr. Spangler served as director of the Yale University Health Services, a healthcare delivery system serving faculty, employees, students, and their dependents. 
She did her residency training at Yale New Haven Hospital and holds an appointment as clinical professor in the Yale School of Medicine Department of Obstetrics, Gynecology and Reproductive, Sci Reproductive Sciences from 2009 to 2011. She also held the position of Associate Vice President for West Campus Planning. Dr. Sandy Bogutsky has been cert board certified in internal medicine, infectious diseases and emergency medicine and joined the Yale Emergency Medicine faculty in 1989. Dr. Bogutsky has held several positions of leadership in the fire service and EMS communities. She served on the board of visitors of the National Fire Academy and conducted on-site investigations of fire, the fighter line of duty deaths. She served for many years on the editorial board of pre-hospital emergency care and was an associate editor of academic emergency medicine. She served two terms on the board of directors of the National Association of EMS Physicians and spent 15 years on the board of directors of the National Registry of EMTs, two of them as chair of the board. And joining us in this trio is Dr. Madison Madeline, or Madeline Wilson. Uh, Dr. Wilson received her bachelor's from Harvard and her medical um, degree from Harvard as well. Uh, she is a Robert Wood Johnson clinical scholar at the Yale um, University. She's a fellow. Uh, she, her, her specialties and professional interests include general preventive care and wellness, diabetes, women's health issues, HIV disease, and chronic disease management. She is currently the director of the COVID-19 testing and tracing program and the chief quality officer for Yale Health. Um, she's designed and implemented university-wide strategies for providing COVID-19 testing, clinical management, and contact tracing to enable safe reopening of the university. She established 15 indoor testing locations with state-of-the-art infection control, conducting to date over 250 tests on over 15,000 unique individuals. Uh, prior to that, she was a deputy medical director and the chief of medicine at Yale Health, where she directed a large, quite a large internal medicine practice which features 24-7 acute care, a 24-7 acute care department, hospitals, hospitalist program and medical subspecialty services at the university owned staff model HMO with 45,000 members. Please help us welcome our speakers and I will turn this over to Dr. Stephanie Spangler. Good morning everyone and thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, I must start with thanks because uh, what we've been on over the past year and a half is a journey that's required the commitment, intelligence, creativity of all of us. And so working with, with you in the community and with our Yale community has been extremely important to get us where we are now. Not that we have not had sad and awful days in our past, uh, but we've worked together to keep our selves and our communities as safe as we possibly can. So thank you for your partnership in that. I thought I would uh, give you a little tour in a moment of how Yale has approached uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic over the past year and a half. One of the biggest challenges is, as you probably know, we, 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 had, we didn't, this was new. This was new to everybody, new to the scientists, new to the healthcare professionals. Not that they could not apply their skills and their knowledge to this new challenge, but it was a new challenge and it's still changing day to day to day, as you can see by reading the press. So actually coping with uncertainty and being able to respond has been one of our, one of our tasks and one of our challenges. Also realizing that this virus knows no boundaries, uh, we realize it's ex ex essential to engage um, and the, the community more broadly in all of our efforts. So I'm glad you're here to hear what we've done, what we plan. And, and so I'm gonna give you a little tour. I think of the pandemic in sort of three stages at Yale. One was the uh, sort of like academic years. That's how, how we think of, of life at Yale. There was the 2019-2020 the year where uh, the pandemic hit in the uh, winter and spring of 2020. There's uh, the 2021 academic year where we attempted to reactivate a number of uh, campus functions. And there's this fall semester that we're just embarking upon where we're inviting more of our Yale community back on campus. And uh, out along the way, we have been guided by um, experts at Yale and outside of Yale. Two of them are with us today, Sandy Boguski and Mad Madeline Wilson. We have a team that just met at seven o'clock this morning as it's met on many days each week at seven o'clock in the morning. We have 
experts who also consult with the CDC, with the WHO, with the Connecticut Department of Public Health, and really grapple with the data we're seeing and the new information that's coming in to try to make the best decisions, help the university and make the best decisions it can. So I'm gonna take you on a pictorial tour of where we were, where we are, and then ask my colleagues to add um, some texture to the, to the tour that I'm going to give you. So maybe we, Maddie, if you could uh, post my slides. Uh, next slide. Those are our logos. We had to develop logos, of course, to, to deal with the pandemic. Next slide. So back in March of 2020, February of 2020, I think we were all concerned about having enough capacity for taking care of very sick patients. Um, not just our students, um, but patients in, in the staff and faculty uh, constituencies and also in the broader community. And we all started out by trying to sending people home as the governor did and as we did, we sent people home and then said, how are we gonna manage to take care of lots of sick people? And we converted our gym into the Landman Center into a field hospital. Um, happily, although that field hospital was very well equipped with negative pressure rooms and testing booths and showers and all kinds of consideration, also we offered the capacity in the Landman Center to Yale New Haven Health System so that members of the community could be um, cared for there if necessary. Happily, we never had to use that center. The hospital never uh, breached its capacity and our students that we thought might be on campus all went home and stayed home. But when we first sent them home, we weren't sure if people were coming back um, during that spring semester or not. Next semester, uh, next slide. Next slide. We also worked hard to, to move all of our activities to remote. Health and safety was certainly the predominant goal that we had, but we wanted to continue our teaching and, and, and research missions to the degree we could. So we worked very hard to move even office furniture as well as computers um, to homes and then to find ways to use what we're using today, Zoom and other methodologies so that teachers could teach, students could learn, staff could work. We did have a small cadre of very uh, devoted staff who did come to campus to keep our essential activities uh, working like utilities and, and others. Next slide. At that time, we were very focused on uh, surfaces and fomites and air quality. And so people were not knowing what to expect in terms of transmissibility of the virus. We're very much suited up to disinfect our spaces. Next slide. At the same time, we are already talking about how might we safely bring people back to campus and how should we do that and what would we need? We certainly realized even then that masks were important and stocked up on masks um, and also san hand sanitizer and disinfectants. And this is a picture of our stock room. And we decided that we would go as, as we got more information about the pandemic, as we worked with the state and the Department of Public Health, that the first group of people we would bring back on campus were the researchers, particularly those that were trying to solve the problem of COVID. And so we worked for, to create distancing, we looked at all of our spaces, brought on uh, protective personal equipment and disinfectants. And here, yeah, that's fine, next slide. And this is a, a view of the labs, not very densely populated. We kept people distance, masked, working shifts, but we wanted to keep this vital function going not only for the university's sake, but for the sake of the public. Um, next slide. And as I said, we then started to bring back some, some teaching, um, uh, but very much with a lot of distancing. You can see we had pictures of people in class where we couldn't have the actual people in class. Uh, the teacher using a face shield, uh, the students all masked. And this we started to do towards the end of last summer, thinking about how we might bring more students back. And indeed in, uh, August of 2020, next slide, we did bring students back. Um, again, very much distanced and masked. We thought about every event in terms of how to prevent transmission. But the one, probably the most uh, important uh, step we took uh, began in our thinking way back in April of 2020, which is if we don't have vaccines, if we don't have all the knowledge about COVID, how can we prevent our community from infecting each other, but even more importantly, from infecting the city of New Haven and the surrounds. 
what could we do to quickly identify cases of COVID, isolate people, because we learned isolation was the most important thing to do. COVID unfortunately loves people and loves to jump from people to people. Um, and so one of the most important measures we took was to create a testing program where we would test our students twice a week uh, in, per in particular, assuming that our students and residents were most likely to be close together and develop asymptomatic infections that could infect others. And so next slide. Uh, wait a minute. That's okay. We developed um, a, a test, built testing booths, developed a testing program, even when tests weren't available. And Dr. Wilson was the mastermind of putting this all together, but it was a really wonderful collaboration between the, the doctors, the experts in testing, and our hospitality staff who got trained to be testers. They were, the, we were not feeding students at, to the capacity we usually were. And so they became, they cross-trained as testers. We've done last year over, uh, over 400,000 tests. Um, and we, we really believe it was our ability to quickly isolate positive cases so they didn't transmit, but kept our numbers relatively low, prevented outbreaks. We had one or two or three outbreaks that we quickly contained. One was among athletes, didn't go further than the athlete group. Another was in a residential college. Another was in a, a professional school. Testing last year with no vaccines was the key. Uh, next slide. Next slide. If we were going to isolate people, we had to find isolation beds. We used, we did not fully populate our campus with students. We decided intentionally, we'd only bring back some students. Freshmen stayed home in the spring, sophomores stayed home in the, in the fall. Many students took a leave of absence. So we had a, a very much reduced density. So we used our dorms to create isolation space. Happily, we did not fill the isolation space at any point in time, didn't come close to filling it, but we were ready with 227 beds and with a process for monitoring students to make sure they did not become severely ill. And so they had food and remote teaching uh, um, opportunities while they were in isolation. Next slide. Uh, we also found it really important to communicate with the community. Again, people really jumped, rose to the occasion. I was gonna say jumped to the occasion and became cross-trained to become experts in giving advice. And we created our campus COVID resource line. We wanted it to be one-stop shopping. If you had a question about COVID itself, your own health, uh, the environment you were living in, uh, whether it was a disinfected properly, a family member's problem, uh, a, a human resource problem, all going to one place so they could quickly get you the help you needed. And that uh, campus COVID resource line last year got 70,000 plus calls. I'm sure we're way, way above that at this point in time. Next slide. We also communicated, Karen mentioned our COVID, um, our COVID uh, website, which should have all the information. I also tried to provide updates. Uh, every week, basically, with maybe the exception of one over Christmas during um, from, from uh, May of 2020 to let the community know what's going on, what they should be thinking about answering questions. Those are all available to all of you as well. We do have a campus alert level. I'll mention that briefly because everybody in the world is using uh, green, yellow, orange, and red. They mean different things with the CDC, different things with the state of Connecticut. And um, uh, so we, we tag our alert level to how likely we think there is going to be transmission on campus because we now have students returning. Um, and it's, we're in a less stable situation with people traveling in. We've raised our alert level to, to yellow, asking people to be very careful about uh, gatherings and other activities that might transmit COVID. Next slide. My slides seem to jumble on this presentation, but so forgive me if they're all, if, if the words and, uh, no, back, back up one. We, um, we also created signage, next slide, around campus. And we trained our students themselves. Our, our health science students leaders became uh, public health coordinators. They lived in the colleges with the undergraduates so they could encourage them in healthy behaviors, reinforce healthy behaviors, help them if they became infected, get to isolation space, help them to quarantine if they were close contacts. And so it was very important to distribute responsibility across the campus. Each school and unit had at least one health and safety leader who was either a faculty member or, or a staff member who took responsibility for a health and safety plan for that unit how many people could be in what room at what time, the kinds of protocols we all had to, 
comport with. Next slide. So the big game changer in last semester was a vaccination. And we changed, converted that Landman Center that had been a field hospital into a vaccination site. And we were extremely fortunate again to have volunteers to help us staff that site. We had nursing students who helped to give vaccinations, fully qualified to do so. And we started to vaccinate our community, both at the Landman Center and through all the sites throughout the state, really encouraging vaccination. Next slide. Um, encouraging and promoting vaccination. But then over the summer, we decided that, that really, if we were gonna bring more people back to campus, we would need to, particularly with the Delta virus, and particularly seeing the efficacy of vaccination, we would require our students and faculty and staff to be vaccinated to come back to campus. So as we thought about, just as we thought about testing for last year, vaccination became the key strategy for bringing people back to campus this year. People are allowed to apply for and do get exemptions from vaccination. They will have additional testing, masking, and other protective uh, measures that they have to follow. Um, but, but vaccination was the key to returning to campus. Next slide. And indeed, uh, we are returning people to campus because, next slide, we have achieved high levels of vaccination on our campus. At this point, 98% of our undergraduate students, 97% of students overall, 92% of staff, and 90, it's closer to 91% of staff now are fully vaccinated. Um, and people are continuing to get vaccinated. Now we thought that last, last spring vaccination would be the sole game changer, but with Delta, as you all know, Delta has a higher rate of transmission. There are some breakthrough infections. And so we are continuing to take a very layered approach to protecting our community and the broader community. Uh, we, we, we realized vaccination alone was not going to do it. It's the linchpin. It's the most protective measure, most protective strategy we could engage. But next slide. We're also continuing with masking indoors for everybody, vaccinated or not, encouraging masking outdoors in gatherings. We're also asking people to avoid gatherings that are very large and, and submitting health and safety plans to our health and safety leaders if they do. We continue to uh, find more isolation space. So we're, we're trying to find the same level of isolation space that we had available last semester. We're currently very close to that in our planning. Um, and most importantly, we're continuing our testing protocols. So anyone who is unvaccinated will test two times a week. Anybody who is vaccinated and is an undergraduate, again, we're focusing where, where people come together in groups we'll test, also test once a week, just so we can get a sense of where we might be in terms of breakthrough infections. And again, the strategy is protect with, with vaccination, protect the community, uh, add on masking, add on additional health and safety measures, and, and continue to test till we get a sense of where transmission is. We're very fortunate to be located in the state of Connecticut and the city of New Haven, where rates, even though they have been rising with Delta, are relatively low and where vaccination rates continue to rise. Um, next slide. <coughs> I'm not gonna go into detail here. As I said, we did have a public health committee. We had to, what I call pop up a public health infrastructure to make decisions and, and get information quickly. That remains in place. Uh, policy committee is, involves a leader of the, of the university where they devote meetings every week, multiple meetings, just to how we're planning on our COVID. Public health committee provides the advice. They meet multiple times a week. We still have our compliance and oversight measures with health and safety leaders and our COVID review team. Next slide, please. I think that's it for me. So we have gone from a field hospital to a vaccination center and we actually reconstituted Landman as a, as a sports facility, although we are always ready to go back to where we need to go um, to either a vaccination center or a field hospital with, with very short notice um, because we have a community that's learned to be extremely uh, collaborative, nimble, creative, and committed to, to protecting themselves and each other. So thank you for allowing me to speak. And I think I will turn it over to since I focused just on testing, Maddie can talk a little bit about our testing program and how it works. And um, then Sandy can talk about surveillance and we can turn it over to you for questions. So thank you very much.
It's hard to it's hard to follow that act. Um, and uh, I think Stephanie really covered uh, the territory. Um, our testing program, uh, as described, um, came together uh, a year ago, 18 months ago, um, and was a really, it was a takes a village kind of operation um, because there was no infrastructure to start testing thousands and thousands of people. And so we really value the collaboration between uh, various members of the public health uh, infrastructure, uh, the medical people, um, the informatics people, because this is um, very challenging uh, uh, from an information standpoint and has really upped our game in terms of how we understand who's on campus, what they're doing, what their test results are, et cetera. Not in a, not in a um, big brother way, but in a um, keep everybody safe way. Um, and then there's our collaboration with uh, our hospitality teams, um, which was um, a real surprise, but a wonderful opportunity for us to work with people we'd never worked with before um, and to give those um, hospitality staff who'd been kind of bumped from their jobs uh, serving food an opportunity to uh, do this totally different work, to learn how to use uh, Epic, and which is our electronic medical record. And um, I think it was a very interesting experience for uh, many of those employees, up to almost 80 people at one point uh, were working in our test sites. Um, so this fall, we are, we are continuing that operation, although we have shrunk from uh, many smaller sites into a small number of larger sites. Um, we have made um, testing widely available uh, to the Yale community. We wish we could open the doors to absolutely everyone, but um, uh, any member of the Yale community uh, can self-schedule a test uh, when they uh, feel concerned, uh, in addition to uh, those that have a testing requirement. And um, most people get their results back electronically in real time within 24 hours. And, and all in all, it's worked quite well. And I'll stop there and, and we can take questions when you're ready. Sandy, do you want to say a few words about how we, uh, Sandy uh, is the leader of, of helping us understand what's going on in the country, the state, the city, the county, and at Yale, and, and produces uh, statistics for our public health committee and leaders of the university on almost a daily basis. Sandy? I'm um, sure. Thanks, Stephanie. <clears throat> There's, there's a, after, after Stephanie and Maddie, there's not a whole lot left to say about um, how the university has managed um, the pandemic. <clears throat> but what, um, what Stephanie is referring to here is, I think everyone who has done any kind of emergency response um, in the past, um, or for that matter, um, any, any major campaign of any kind, um, has to be undergirded by um, information and uh, making sure that um, there's a common operating picture, not everyone doing their own um, search for information, coming up with different sources, um, contributing to what I know Chief Alston would recognize as the fog of war and makes a, makes a cohesive or coherent uh, response impossible. So one of the things that um, has, um, has, has been part of our overall university response has been um, compiling the data from reliable sources, crosswalking um, the uh, information that we get to make sure that um, it, it matches other reliable sources uh, and then reporting it to the people who need it in a format that is uh, brief enough so that it's usable, um, but complete enough so that you can make um, targeted responses um, and you don't have to um, go to um, the meat cleaver response of um, chopping out everything that, um, that we uh, are doing in hopes of um, stomping out infections, but rather um, seeing where it looks like there may be failures, where there may be a threat of increasing infection and uh, attempting to make um, very targeted interventions uh, in order to prevent that. And that's, uh, going both from the, uh, from the community to the university, um, and also very importantly from the uh, university to the community um, as we um, interact with each other. 
So that has been um, a lot of my um, contribution to the uh, to our efforts. And I think rather than going into further detail on how we've gone about doing that, um, I'll uh, send it back to Stephanie or Karen and entertain questions. Yeah, I wanted to add one thing. Thank you so much. Uh, Sandy and Maddie are uh, fabulous colleagues and leaders. Um, one of the things I talked about the layered approach, as we learned more about, about COVID, there are a couple things that dropped off. I think we were all washing our, our groceries last, uh, last spring. And we did realize that, that surfaces are not the, not the risk that they were in the past. So we're less focused, although we're, we're certainly cleaning our buildings and we have increased cleaning um, schedules. We're more focused on making sure that uh, people are convening in well-ventilated spaces, preferably outdoors whenever possible, and less focused on suiting people up like we did uh, um, in the past and less focused on washing everything. Although I think it's a good practice anyhow, because lots of things, lots of things can get transmitted. Um, and so the hand washing is actually probably the most important thing so that you don't take things from another place to your uh, face or nose or mouth. So I did want to add that one layer didn't, didn't survive in the same way it did last spring. So we'll take questions. Yes, we absolutely will. I encourage. So you you are invited to ask uh, your questions. You can add them to the chat. You can use the raise hand icon if you like me to call on you. I will allow you to unmute your um, selves um, as well if you like to ask your question verbally. So we're ready for questions. We'll take answers as well. If you have answers, <laughs> we'll take those. <laughs> Ms. Shaw, uh, yes. Hi, I couldn't find the uh, the hand raised icon. So, <laughs> um, but, but well, my, my question is, you speak about how you know uh, how you how how you took care of everything within the Yale community, um, but a lot of the Yale community lives out lives out in. Mm -hmm my community, meaning out, out, uh, out in New Haven. So was there collaboration um, between the city of New Haven and Yale? Um, because you guys have the research, you know, we're, you know, we're the people who, who get the results, you know, good, bad, mm -hmm. or indifferent. But um, I would think that we need that collaboration in order to, uh, to make sure everyone's safe, because if the community isn't safe, Yale isn't safe. Yeah, actually, thank you so much for that question. That is an excellent question. And we were, we were assuming in March of the, I think one of our most serious considerations was if we're gonna bring students back in the fall of 2020, we need to keep the New Haven community safe from our students. <laughs> that's, that's why we were, that was one of the primary considerations in our testing strategy. Yes, we wanted our students to be safe and healthy, but the, the people who at that, at that point, at that phase, Delta is showing us some somewhat different um, features of itself, but at that phase, the young people were often had no symptoms. It was people in the community and, and including our staff and, and faculty who lived in the community who are at risk for serious disease. So a, a, a lot of the thinking behind our testing strategy was to make sure we didn't become a source of infection for the community. Now that's only one way we, but the, uh, I'm, I'm glad that you asked the question so I could clarify that and I'm, I invite my, my colleagues to, to join in. And, and I think um, I would never, I, I, I think we, had favor a favorable experience in that regard. We were not finding that we were we were finding more the reverse. People went out and brought infections in, which is you know that happened with travel and gatherings and things like that. In terms of other collaborations, we we um, collaborated with the city health department um, to see how we might share resources. Um, we offered our vaccine center and our Landman Field Hospital uh, to the city. We actually the isolation housing. When we first set it up, we made it, it was first there for first responders and members of the city. 
Um, so you're and the research um, was so. I mean, we we're doing a lot of this on the on the spot, you know, because we didn't know a lot about COVID. I think I'll let Sandy add to that to that aspect of the collaboration. But thank you very much. That's a very important question for us. Yeah, thank you. Um, there, there's um, some additional. Uh, uh, <clears throat> facets to our to our involvement with the city. Um, for example, um, we have a very robust contact tracing um, and and um, source of outbreak uh, investigation team, uh, which uh, helped us to control um, infections um, or transmission of the uh, infection on campus. Um, so, for example, anyone who was recognized as a close contact of someone who uh, ended up with an infection um, was um, quarantined uh, in, in the previous year before we had vaccination um, in order to prevent onward transmission. And that was very successful. But those, um, those individuals also notified uh, the city uh, public health department, <clears throat> excuse me, when, when, the, um, when there was either um, close contact uh, among city members uh, or uh, an, <clears throat> a source of an outbreak, which was in the city. Um, and so uh, we had, we, we had uh, Maritza Bonds on our um, quick dial, uh, as well as a number of her staff members uh, who, who took the same types of measures that we did on campus um, with the city. Uh, so um, those types of resources were absolutely shared to the mutual benefit of the, of the city and the campus. One other thing I would add is that, um, you know, our community includes um, the 45,000 members of Yale Health, um, uh, which includes many, many employees and their families. So uh, the, the Yale Health population reflects New Haven in many, many ways. And um, by, by uh, providing testing and uh, care management support. And, um, uh, you know, I think that th that was one of the ways that we helped to take care of New Haven and to minimize uh, the impact that any on-campus activity could have had uh, in the wider community. And in fact, many of our cases were uh, in independence uh, of our employees who live in New Haven and didn't necessarily come uh, come to campus, but um, we uh, used our contact tracing resources and supported those individuals as well. So it really does take a village and we're, we are completely interdependent and, um, uh, and really cherish that connection. Thank you. Thank you. Speaking of community, I, I see that Chief Alston has joined us this morning, you've been here the entire time. So thank you for joining us. Uh, any other questions or Stephanie said answers? I don't see any in the chat, but you can also mute yourselves and ask your question directly. I have a comment from Rose. Thank you, Rose. Uh, she says, Thanks you, thank you for explaining and showing the organization Yale provided for the COVID-19 virus. Glad you used the staff to perform tasks to help with testing COVID. No matter what the position employee holds, they are valuable and can learn other job services. Yale did a good job in providing for the students and its workers. Uh, you do not want to spread yourselves too thin. Yale always does a good job for the task at hand. Thank you, Rose. I agree. Thank you very much. That's very, we appreciate that. It's amazing how many people came together, though. It's just, just, it's just breathtaking to see, you know, people doing things they never imagined they would be doing before, um, but but doing it quickly and doing it well. So, so thank you for that, and the community as well. I mean, everybody's had to come together. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay, I'm the hog of the day. Um, <laughs> Um, is, is the, is, is Delta or, or does Delta have to be treated differently from, uh, from COVID-19? Um, I mean, since it just sort of popped up out of, out of nowhere, um, yeah. and it also made me wonder if it was a mutation. Well, 
Okay, so it's really kind of uh, COVID-19 and a half, and we're waiting for COVID. <laughs> COVID-21. <laughs> oh, okay. And it doesn't, you know, we don't, we don't treat it differently in, in the sense of how we uh, manage individuals who test positive, but we are aware that it is not the same animal um, from a epidemiologic standpoint, meaning from the standpoint of how it spreads from person to person and um, how those cases behave. Uh, we do know that, that um, uh, Delta can uh, break through vaccination um, and uh, because Delta, the rise of Delta, which really hit New Haven in the late, late June, early July and, and rapidly became the dominant virus, that overlapped with the rise of vaccination. So it's sometimes hard to break out what did what, but um, we have definitely seen more uh, breakthrough cases um, since Delta came along. And we also, there's also some evidence that perhaps Delta, when it causes severe disease, can, um, can be a little more serious than the preceding variants, but that mainly affects people who are, who are unvaccinated. And um, uh, even as we see breakthrough cases, um, uh, vaccine continues to provide strong and critical um, protection for those who, uh, who are vaccinated, it keeps people out of the hospital, it reduces death rates. And we have, I don't have them handy, but we have some very um, striking graphs that show the difference in hospitalization and death and severe disease between Connecticut residents who are vaccinated and those who are unvaccinated. So anything that we can do to help you to promote um, vaccination in the community, we would be happy to partner on because in some ways, New Haven has lagged a bit in terms of vaccination rates compared with the rest of the state. And one of the reasons we reintroduced some, we, we, we reinvigorated our testing program was, was because of the uncertainties around Delta. So that's part of the reason we're testing our vaccinated um, students as at least for the, for the first month to see where, what the breakthrough rates are and get a little better handle on Delta. I have a question for you. Can you uh, talk a bit about um, booster shots? Who needs them when? <laughs> if, you, if you took the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, do you need a booster? Can you give us inf any information on that? So who would like to take that? Um, Sandy, do you wanna take the booster shot question? I'll, I'll channel my inner Jason here. <clears throat> um, the the science is Jason Schwartz, who is on the uh, uh, governor's committee on vaccination, vac vaccine advisory committee, and he's one of our faculty. But go ahead. There's um, the the science is not well set yet on that. Um, so and and um, to to a certain extent, the politics has gotten ahead of the science, and so uh, there's been a, a great deal of <clears throat> um, posturing in Washington by various agencies and by the White House itself. Um, regarding uh, the concern about the Delta virus. Um, some studies, um, mostly small ones, uh, but coming um, mostly again out of the international community uh, where it appeared that there was waning immunity or um, that, that the uh, vaccine lost its effectiveness over a period of many months after vaccination. <clears throat> we, don't have, uh, we don't have large enough studies to really draw conclusions from those yet. Um, but the, um, the three major um, groups, the uh, Food and Drug Administration who um, approves the um, vaccines and um, then the, um, the CDC um, advisory group, um, the ACIP, um, which determines whether or not there's a um, <clears throat> Whether, whether or not there's adequate data to suggest that this is needed um, and what the timing on it should be. And then finally, the, um, the CDC itself, which would make a recommendation. Um, all of those groups are meeting um, at a very um, uh, 
uh, increased rate right now to examine all of the data that are available. Um, and we are expecting that there's going to be some formal uh, uh, recommendations over the next several weeks. Uh, but right now there is not one other than what the White House has said, which is that by around the third week of September, they hope to be rolling out boosters. The one group that is already um, eligible um, and, and has been uh, has started getting uh, booster vaccinations um, is the, the group that is uh, uh, very immunocompromised. Uh, those who are, uh, for example, have had um, organ transplants and have their immunity suppressed to tolerate that, um, or um, those who have other diseases that um, cause their medications um, or the diseases themselves that suppress immunity. And those groups have already um, begun to receive boosters. Um, the, the next ones who will probably be eligible um, are those who, as we know, um, were the first ones to get um, their um, vaccinations back in the um, winter and early spring last year, which are um, healthcare workers who are, have the greatest risk of exposure to the disease. And then um, the elderly and, and people with other um, comorbid or, or other um, diseases that might make them more vulnerable to, uh, in, to uh, adverse uh, outcomes associated with the infection. So that's um, right now, though, we are operating um, still with what uh, those uh, advisory groups consider to be a paucity of um, adequate data to make their recommendations. And they're at very actively working on it. Thank you. I don't see any other questions. So Ms. with King, that- can I just oh. make a short comment? Good morning sure, all. Chief. Good morning. Good to see you all in this uh, in this virtual format. Ms. Ms. Thomasina, I haven't seen you in a while. It's so good to see I you. I miss you too. I miss you. <laughs> <laughs> and I miss Dr. Bogutsky. How's it going, Cindy? Good to see you. Uh, I had the third shot two weeks ago, and I opted to take it. It was offered, and I opted to take it. And I'll tell you my rationale. I used to do missionary work, and I continue to do it when, we, when we're able to do it. And there are many times we traveled in-country. It was recommended, because we'd had vaccinations before, that we get a booster, whether it was yellow fever, um, uh, uh, not TB, I'm missing my tetanus or whatever, uh, because we do know that they lose their efficacy. So uh, in this, I knew that I had taken Moderna and Moderna was going to be submitting data this week to the CDC on the efficacy of the third shot booster. So I wanted to make sure I was part of that. And so I'm not immunocompromised or anything else like that, but I wanted that the, to be part of that data set. So I did take the third shot, it was fine. Uh, because of our vocation, obviously I get tested probably more so than a lot of folks. Um, and uh, thank God we're still healthy and still good. But I do want to um, also thank Yale. I haven't had an opportunity to thank you for the support you've given my department. When this all started, even housing our members uh, who were positive, I greatly, greatly appreciate that. So uh, let's keep our community safe and safe and healthy. All right. Thank you so much for sharing that. Now, you you didn't do this as part of a trial to get the data. Is that right? It was, it, but the data will be part it of the data. included in the data set. Yeah. yeah. Great. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you. We have one last uh, question here uh, in the chat. Um, the comment is people speak about getting COVID and trying not to get COVID. What does it mean to get COVID or not? Is it about testing positive, being a carrier, coming down with symptoms, et cetera? Uh, they're asking in the context of sending their daughter back to school, first grade, and just that they're trying to decide between virtual and in-person um, mm -hmm. gaps. Yeah, those are, those, are difficult, those are difficult choices for parents to, to think through. Um, you know, getting COVID means, uh, typically means testing positive, and that can mean either with or without symptoms. Um, uh, on our campus, we're testing a lot of uh, asymptomatic 
people um, just to make sure we catch any cases early because early cases can be asymptomatic and people can transmit when they have no symptoms. Um, so both, both things can result in a situation where there is a risk of transmission to another individual. One thing we are noticing with, um, with Delta and in particular with people who are fully vaccinated is that the symptoms can be quite mild and what we call nonspecific, meaning it could be this, it could be that, it could be a cold, it could be, so people with stuffy nose, sore throat, mild headaches may in fact have uh, COVID so that people um, ideally need to have kind of a low threshold to going and getting a test um, uh, to make sure that they're not in a position to be uh, communicating uh, an infection to someone else in their community who may not be vaccinated or who may be immunocompromised. Um, so I don't know if that I don't know if that helps. Uh, it doesn't help with some of the difficult decisions that I know parents are facing. Um, but I think you know masking in schools and schools taking all of the appropriate precautions to reduce risk of transmission in the school, um, we have seen that those interventions can be effective. They work. Um, it doesn't mean there will be no cases, but they can allow in-person education to take place, whether it be at the grade school level or at the uh, university level. I said, thank you. Yes, this helps. Thank you for that. Well, with that, we are going to uh, conclude this morning's breakfast. I want to thank again, uh, Drs. Spangler, Wilson, and Babuski for uh, joining us this morning. And thank you all for joining us. I know we've come through uh, ongoing pandemic, Henri, Ida, etc. I hope you all continue to stay safe and healthy. And I look forward to seeing you at next month's community breakfast. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you.